Thank you so very much. I'm Helen Stewart and I'm Lamar Polk. And we're so happy to be here together to talk a little bit about resource facilitation and interdisciplinary collaboration. Before we get started, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge that Helen and I have chosen to be in the same space because we want to demonstrate the type of collaboration and the bridge building that we hope to underscore in this presentation. With that said, we are being mindful of the current state and what the requirements are for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And so we are going to remain socially distant. Um, and we also are aware that each other has been fully vaccinated and encourage others to do so as well. Yes, for sure. We are certainly mindful of the current COVID status within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Next slide, please. Our objectives for today are these. We hope, after having sat through this presentation, you'll know what exactly we mean by collaboration between brain injury and substance use providers through a few case studies. We hope you'll be able to describe the resources and this very, very real need for collaboration among brain injury and substance use providers statewide. And we'll talk a little bit about the resources for brain injury and substance use disorders statewide for individuals. Wow. What do you think, Lamar? This, this slide says it all, doesn't mm -hmm. it? I know that I represent the brain injury community, and Lamar represents the substance use community. And what we have found in preparing this presentation is that we actually are building those bridges. Mm -hmm. I've learned so much more about Lamar's world, and he's learned so much more about my world. And no one in this time and age, when we're expected to do so much with so little and so little time, no one has all the answers. And I know in the future, if I have a question about anything in the substance use world, I will reach out to Lamar. And hopefully he'll reach out to me for any ideas around brain injury. But I think this slide says it all. We are here to build bridges between. Hmm, partners. Well, Gabby did a great job covering she did. a lot of that. She did. But we'll just quickly go over it because the partners in this grant are very important. For example, Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission, usually referred to as MRC by all of us, is really the lead state agency for brain injury services within our com commonwealth. They do provide comprehensive services to folks with all kinds of disabilities, and their goal is to maximize the quality of life and economic self-sufficiency for that person within his or her community. They focus on three delivery areas. We all know about Voc Rehab and what a wonderful, wonderful uh, service that provides. Interesting, they're the, they're the folks that really um, are the ones that determine disability services within the Commonwealth. But mostly, we're going to focus on community living services. Within the community, there are all kinds of services available. And this is not just for folks with brain injury, but for folks with any type of disability. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with all of them. As far as brain injury goes, MRC helps with the whole waiver program. For people with traumatic brain injury, under the Mass Rehabilitation Commission comes SHIP, or the Statewide Head Injury Program, and a waiver that is specific 
for folks with TBI, that is traumatic brain injury. For anyone with an acquired brain injury, which does cover TBI, but also non-traumatic brain injuries, are several programs. There is the ABI waiver, the Moving Forward Plan, which was previously known as Money Follows the Person, and TBI waivers and different programs. But for any brain injury survivors, services are available as far as home care assistance, supportive living programs, and of course, vocational rehab. SHIP, the statewide head injury program, supports individuals living with a traumatic brain injury. And you've learned from Dr. Sparadio in the previous sessions that a traumatic brain injury is something that happens from the outside in. So SHIP, or the state head injury program, is available for people with an externally caused brain injury, or TBI. That person needs to be a resident of Massachusetts. It's not age dependent at all. And this person would be one who has a loss of pre-injury level of functioning and has significant impairments, really, um, like behavioral, cognitive, or physical functioning due to this traumatic brain injury. And of course, the person has to have an ability and a willingness to participate in community-based services. What does SHIP provide? Well, services can include case management and all of the other services that you hear, hear, see here on the screen. Another thing I want to say is that SHIP services are not dependent upon income. So there is no income eligibility for SHIP services. Now, how does one connect with SHIP? How does one connect with MRC? There is a fantastic new way to do that now. MRC has gone digital. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, you still can do the written form or the in-person form or the over-the-phone form. But now you can go right online and fill out a form there or work with your person uh, to fill out the form or suggest that a family member helps the person um, and go right online and fill in all the blanks and then MRC will have all the information that they need in one place to help identify programs and services that best fit the needs of the individual. And that, that's a wonderful thing. They have a great team of folks manning that line or personing that line. And it has very much streamlined the whole application process. So do check it out. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, which consists of a variety of different bureaus and offices, but we're really going to zone in on the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, which is the single state authority for addiction and substance use for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. BSAS, as we call it, has a variety of different roles, but if you were to boil them down to their core components, you'd really see that BSAS oversees a statewide system that's focused on prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery support services for individuals, families, and communities that are affected by substance use. So what is BSAS responsible for? It's actually responsible for a number of different things. So some of the things it's responsible for include the licensing of substance use disorder treatment programs. And those programs typically are for people that have MassHealth or Massachusetts Medicaid or uninsured. It's responsible for licensing substance use disorder counselors at a variety of different levels, certifying substance use recovery coaches, developing and implementing substance use disorder policies and programs, and tracking substance use disorder treatment trends across the state with the hope of improving the services that we provide and making sure that we're connected 
to populations that may be underserved or may be at higher risk of fatal overdose. When we talk about the prevention component, this is just an example of some of the prevention campaigns that BSAS currently has. And as you can see, our prevention campaigns are really trying to convey a message, messages like the ways to stop an overdose, that we support a state without stigma, and this idea that addiction is a treatable illness. So within BSAS, there is a treatment system that we support, and it's a full continuum of treatment and recovery. And as I said before, the treatment system is really focused on those individuals who are the most marginalized, typically qualifying for mass health, as well as, as, well as those who are underinsured or uninsured. And so I wanted to take a moment just to go through some of the different levels of care um, to help people understand um, what it is that you receive at these levels of care, and also to make sure that when people hear these words, maybe from the clients that they work with, that they mean something to them. So the most acute treatment level that we have within our system um, is called the acute treatment services, also known as detox. So basically at this level of care, what a client would receive would be a medically monitored withdrawal process, as well as some initial services and support to help someone begin their recovery journey. Uh, level of care slightly lower than that is our short-term short rehab or stabilization services. Um, sometimes you hear this referred to as a step down. Sometimes you'll hear the term holding program. With the step down, what we're really talking about is a level of care that is kind of the next step for someone who's leaving detox, um, but is still in that kind of earlier phase of recovery and would benefit from some more intensive support and some additional stabilization before going on to something more long-term. And then with the holding programs, that's another step-down space where often people will go to continue their stabilization and also to acquire the necessary sober time and get in the right space to really be able to actively engage in long-term residential treatment and to do that with success. And so, like I said, we do have long-term residential treatment. Oftentimes, you may hear that called a halfway house. Um, and in our continuum, there are a number of different residential treatment spaces that we have. So we have family residential programs. We have pregnant and postpartum residential programs, recovery homes, thera commu com therapeutic communities, um, as well as a newer type of residential placement, our co-occurring enhanced programs. All have specific purposes, all have specific criteria um, for being admitted, but they're, they're there to really make sure that people who are ready for that phase of their recovery journey, their recovery process, are receiving adequate support to help them keep moving forward. And lastly, we have a variety of different community-based treatment options. Um, so it's everything that you see listed here. It's outpatient counseling. It's day programming, which tends to be a more intensive form of outpatient counseling. Medication-assisted treatment, which are medications that support people that use substances, specific ones, such as alcohol or opioids, um, in, in finding some relief and supporting their recovery process more through a pharmacological mechanism. Um, medications for opioid use disorder, which specifically are focused on providing pharmacological relief for opioid use. Um, the Massachusetts Impaired Driving Program, which formerly was known as the um, Driver Alcohol Education Program. The SSPs, or the syringe service programs, sometimes referred to as needle exchanges, um, our recovery high schools, our overdose education and naloxone distribution. So a variety of different community-based services that are really designed to kind of meet people where they're at in their recovery process and get the help that they need to continue moving forward in ways that feel comfortable for them. Um, and then we have our recovery support services. Um, so the hope is that a person kind of goes through the continuum of treatment, finds recovery, and then will engage in some of these services if it would be helpful to help sustain their recovery. 
So that includes our recovery support centers, which are scattered across the state and really offer spaces for people in recovery to come together, to socialize, to be, and do that in a sober environment. Recovery coaching, um, which is, is really an advocate who understands what you're going through and is really pushing for your success um, to move forward in your recovery journey. Sober housing, um, there are a variety of different certified sober houses through the state um, that we have some oversight for. And then transitional housing case management to really make sure that when people are kind of in transitional spaces that they're getting the necessary case management services to really support them in being successful. Um, this also kind of acknowledges the fact that, you know, recovery involves a variety of different things, including the social determinants of health, as we often talk about, um, housing, education, et cetera, and that those things need to be tended to and supported as well so that a person can have the most successful recovery possible. Oh, my. It's wonderful to hear about all of these substance use disorder um, services mm -hmm. that are available. And I love what you said at the end about putting a person in the best possible position for success. I think that as clinicians um, and as people who work within agencies, that is our goal. Definitely. We all want the same thing. We want to put our people in the best position mm -hmm. for success. And isn't this what this grant is all about? Very much so. Yes. Well, thank you for all that information about substance use. Let's talk a little bit about the brain injury side. The Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts has for a mission statement to help provide a brighter future for brain injury survivors and their families. Well, my goodness, it's a kind of a, a lofty mission statement to be sure. How do we go about doing that? Well, we do it through prevention, education, advocacy, and support. As far as advocacy goes, well, our roots really are in advocacy. The Brain Injury Association was born through advocacy. A group of moms realized that after their children who had sustained traumatic brain injury had gone through the normal trajectory of care and miraculously they were home again with their families but there was no support for them within Massachusetts. And so these moms lobbied for support. And boy, I'll tell you, when you get a group of moms together and their children need something, there is nothing that will stop them. And thank heavens that these women were unstoppable. And it was through their efforts that the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts was born. In fact, SHIP has its roots within that movement. Uh, the establishment of SHIP under the auspices of the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission was connected way back in 1985. Hutchinson versus Patrick was a federal class action lawsuit on behalf of a gal uh, named Kathy Hutchinson and then for anybody with acquired brain injury. And that was something, again, that the Brain Injury Association supported Kathy and advocated for her through this whole process. And Kathy was a gal who had sustained a traumatic brain injury, was in a nursing home, but said, I deserve to le lead my life in the least restrictive environment. And yet there was no place for her to go. It was through these efforts that all of the waiver programs came about and people like Kathy found homes within the community to live their lives. There is also right now, and Gabby did make reference to it, and I will make reference to it again, uh, a community center, a pilot community center in Worcester um, through BAMSI that serves the needs of adults with acquired brain injuries. If you yourself want to become an advocate, there's still space for you to advocate for services for folks with brain injury. 
Right now, the cognitive rehabilitation bill is still within our state house, and it is advocating for the gold standard of care for folks with acquired brain injury. And we believe that cognitive rehabilitation is the gold standard of care, and we believe that commercial health insurance plans should cover cognitive rehabilitation after any brain injury. If you're interested in becoming an advocate for that, do visit our website and find out more about it. And another thing that we have done is the Brain Injury Commission has been reestablished. They have been meeting, they have been active, and soon the commission report will come out. Prevention, my you know, there's, there's a little question, a little trick question, mind you. How do you cure a brain injury? I wish there was a good answer. <laughs> I wish that there was. There is no cure for a brain injury. The only cure is prevention, and that's why we do it. If you know a child, have a child, love a child, or think that they're mildly amusing, think about the Think Ahead program. The Think Ahead program is a wonderfully designed class that goes into the schools. It's age appropriate from the littlest person to the biggest high school senior. And it poses the question of how can you make good choices to take good care of your one precious brain. There are activities involved within this class and the young people come away with a newfound respect for their brain because they've learned about what a wonderful, wonderful thing we have in our brains. And they also know to take good care of their one precious brain. Brains at Risk is a program for folks who perhaps have made a few bad decisions and find themselves needing to attend classes to learn more about their brains and about the decisions that they're making. Sometimes people are invited by the courts to come for driving under the influence or um, risky driving or even risky behavior within the community. Um, but again, it's not a punitive program. It asks the question, how can you make better choices to take good care of your one precious brain? We also have a speakers bureau that will go to any community um, organization like the Rotary Club or the Lions Club or anybody who will listen to us because the beginning of prevention is awareness and we really, really want to spread awareness of brain injury within the community and within the Commonwealth. Did I say something about education? Yes. Educate, educate, educate. Education is power. We have every year a brain injury conference. It's usually at the end of March. March is Brain Injury Awareness Month. And this year was our first time doing a virtual conference, and it was incredible. But next year, wait and listen and go to our annual brain injury conference because there are so many sessions um, offered about every aspect of brain injury. There are professionals there, there are survivors there, there are family members, there are caregivers, or anybody who just wants to know more about brain injury. We've had almost 800 people present for our conferences, and it's something that you just don't want to miss if you want cutting edge information about brain injury within Massachusetts. We also have an acquired Brain Injury Clinical Continuing Education Series. And you can find out more information about that on our website under education. And you can get continuing education credits for all of our offerings. There's also the Academy of Certified Brain Injury Specialist Certification. And if you want to be seen as a brain injury specialist within your organization, do look into that. It goes very much in depth about all aspects of brain injury so that you can be a resource 
in your organization. And then, as always, there is survivor education too. For me, support and resources is kind of the heart of our organization. I guess I would call it that. You are all welcome to call us, to use us in any way that you can to find resources and support for your folks with brain injury. If you have a question about brain injury, call us. If you're wondering about something, call us. We are here for you. That's what we do. Now, if you want to give someone with a brain injury a wonderful gift, do encourage that person, that person's caregivers, that person's family to, to come to our support groups. You know, just like, well, Lamar, you know, the, the peer advocacy and the 12-step programs mm -hmm. and things like that make such a difference in the substance use world. Our support groups make a difference in our world. Mm. It's within a support group that people find kindred spirits. And I know for a fact that it is in a support group that real learning takes place. We have so many wonderful resources in the professional world for brain injury survivors. But you know, I hear very frequently, why don't people get it? Mm -hmm. You know, why don't they understand it? And, and yes, um, we're grateful to the wonderful professionals in our world who really can give us the, the education, the facts, the book learning about brain injury. But until you can make a connection on a real gut level to brain injury, um, and, and I wish there was a better way than being a survivor to be able to do that, but it's an experiential kind of a thing that really makes a difference. I'll never forget a group that I was facilitating, and a gal sat there. It was her first time in a group, and her eyes were just big. She was just taking it all in. And at the end of the group, she quietly said, I feel as if I finally found my tribe. Mm. And she's been coming to groups for years since then. And it makes a difference in the lives of survivors. Oh, I want to tell you that the Brain Injury Association does not ask for your insurance card. It doesn't ask for a note from your doctor to prove that you have a brain injury. All of our services are open to anybody whose life is impacted by brain injury. So please, pass the goodness on. Now, what are other resources for folks with brain injury? Well, there's no wrong entry into these services, and one of our partners is the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. And you say, elders? Is it just old people with brain injury? No, 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 no. The Executive Office of Elder Affairs has services for the elderly and disabled individuals, and a brain injury is a type of disability. So, of course, you can connect with services through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. What they do is try to connect individuals with disabilities and their caregivers with agencies and organizations that can best meet their needs. Mass Options comes under the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, and it's a free counseling service to help any older person or adult of any age with a disability and their family members to find people who will help them to make decisions about supportive services if they just don't know where to turn. And here is a toll-free number. And of course, you can reach them online at massoptions.org. Again, there is the Massachusetts Aging and Disability Resource Consortia, which has the acronym ADRC. And really, they also will provide counseling and help to meet, people, um, meet people's needs regardless of their age or their disability. The neat thing about this is that you can access this 
in your local elder services office, or there are in all over the Commonwealth, there are these independent living centers, the ILCs, and you can go to one of them or contact one of them right within your community. It doesn't have to be this big statewide agency because it's funneled right into your very own community. And you can find resources through the ILCs also. And any help actually filling out forms or anything like that, they're great places. Now, Lamar, you talked a lot about Mass Health, mm -hmm. and again, we're seeing those waiver programs. And I'll go a little bit more into detail here. And you say, well, why is it showing up in one place and then again in another? Well, to be eligible for these waivers, you do need to have Mass Health. So they are Mass Health based. There are two home and community based services waivers to help mass health eligible people with brain injury go from a nursing facility, a chronic disease hospital or a rehab center back into their communities. In fact, a person is eligible to look at that after 90 consecutive days in one of these facilities. And they help with every bit of moving from a facility back into community-based services. What a joy it is for an individual to finally find a place where they can live the least restrictive life that they can. So the two ABI waivers, one is for residential habilitation, and that's for people who need supervision and staffing 24-7. The other for non-residential habilitation, a person could move into his or her own home or apartment or to the home of somebody else within the community and receive services under this. It, it's amazing that this is available. Remember Kathy Hutchinson? It was her lawsuit, her federal class action lawsuit that got things going. So there are two moving forward plan waivers also. And again, this would be not brain specifically for brain injury people, but for anybody with a disability. And there is a handbook available. I was thrilled to find this. This is not just the brochure. This is the actual handbook so that if you are dealing with someone who would benefit from any of these waivers, it has the guidelines, the rules, so to speak, of living within uh, the community under one of these programs. Thanks, Helen. So part of the reason that we're taking some time to talk about different mass health resources is because a number of the people that we work with on either side of the aisle, people that have both of these challenges mm -hmm. of brain injury and substance use, um, are mass health recipients, and yes. they tend to be some of the more vulnerable and underserved um, residents within our state. And so now I want to shift a little bit to some of the substance use specific resources, acknowledging that these resources um, would be helpful for a variety of different people that use substances, including people that have brain injuries. So the first resource I wanted to talk about was the Community Support Program, um, which is often called a CSP worker. And so these are community-based paraprofessionals who support members with psychiatric and or substance use disorders that interfere with their ability to access essential medical services. And so a CSP worker is really designed to support people against transitions where they tend to be a bit more vulnerable and to support them for a focused period of time. And some of the support can include service coordination and linkages to care, um, some short-term transportation, um, especially while PT1s are prescriptions for transportation or getting put into place, assisting with obtaining some benefits and some housing-related services, and then fostering empowerment, recovery, and wellness. Um, another MassHealth resource um, that's very important um, and helpful for people 
that use substances are recovery support navigators or RSNs. And so these two are paraprofessionals, but they're really focused on supporting a person in recovery and navigating the different treatment system and treatment options that are available. You know, as we talked about before, there are a number of different levels of care and a number of different resources out there. And even for me, as someone who works in this world, it can actually get really confusing. Um, so the Recovery Support Navigator is there to really take away some of that confusion and to try to make sure that people are getting connected to the best services and the best supports in the best moment in time for their recovery. And then just wanted to lift up recovery coaches. Um, some of you may be familiar with that particular professional. Um, it's definitely gained um, a larger following over time. But the idea is that you get connected with someone who is a peer, someone who is in recovery um, and has found some success with recovery and now wants to kind of pay it forward in essence. Um, so recovery coaches are really there to support peers in gaining hope and exploring recovery um, and achieving life goals. And they're life goals that they have beyond just their addiction recovery. There it is again, putting a person in the best position for success. Definitely. Yeah. And working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the last resource I wanted to underscore was the Massachusetts Consultation Services for Treatment of Addiction and Pain, also known as MCSTAP. Um, so this is a clinical consultation service for clinicians serving individuals with chronic pain, addiction, or both. It's available Mondays through Fridays from 9 to 5 by calling the number that's on your screen. And it can be used by physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, so a variety of different prescribing providers, but it can also be used by nurses and behavioral health clinicians and care managers. Um, there's a certain complexity that comes with addiction, there's a certain complexity that comes with pain. There's a certain complexity that comes with brain injury. So this is just another resource to help people to kind of suss out those complexities um, to help clients move forward. Well, thank you, Lamar. You know, you've given me a lot to think about. <laughs> you have. BMZ. Now... BAMSI is a word that reflects the Brockton Area Multi-Services Incorporated. And rather than just using it as the Brockton area, um, people use the term BAMSI because it is bigger than just the Brockton area. It is, there are 120 locations across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So saying it's just the Brockton area is kind of making it a little bit too small. But you know, they're in the business of bringing people and services together. And it is a private nonprofit organization that has been around since, what, 1975. So it's been around for a while. And I was surprised to learn that they serve more than 50,000 individuals mm -hmm. every year. And there is a, a shot of the New Start Brain Injury Community Center to which Gabby referred at the beginning. And it is up and running in Worcester. Um, to be eligible, you need to have documentation of an acquired brain injury or, and a referral from Mass Rehab. But for those that are not directly referred by Mass Rehab, BMC will work with folks um, to make sure that there is um, a verification of the brain injury and that the referral meets the criteria um, for both the New Start Brain Injury Community Center and MRC. They'll help you out with it. What happens there? Well, we'll see on the next slide. It is a multi-service area in Worcester. It, it services individuals 22 plus living with brain injury. And really what they try to do is to increase community integration. You've probably learned that isolation is, is one of the hallmarks of brain injury. So instead of having folks just kind of being alone in their houses, um, what they're trying to do is get people out into the community and 
of course, during during this COVID time, um, at first it was just virtual, and now it's a combination of virtual and of in person as safe uh, and um, as under the direction of um, the governor and and the Department of Public Health, of course. But you know, it's individualized so that a person's own goals are taken into consideration. And what happens there is member driven. So it's building a community of folks and putting them in a position for success. Also, as Gabby mentioned at the beginning, there is um, a grant oriented substance use disorder, brain injury, intensive case management person provided to folks who fall under those categories. And the goal of this individual is to coordinate and provide care that's safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and most importantly, client-centered. And you can access um, that program through the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts. Fancy's a great example of an organization that really is building that bridge. Yep. It's an organization yep. that is providing services for folks with brain injuries, whether they be traumatic brain injuries or acquired brain injuries. And they're also providing a variety of resources for people that use substances. And so some of their substance use resources um, include a peer recovery support center, um, which is something that we had talked about earlier that BSAS funds and sponsors. Um, and then they also have a community outreach prevention and education center, which they call COPE. And that particular center is really rooted in something called harm reduction. Um, and so a lot of the services that they provide are an outgrowth of that. So they're services that genuinely are meeting people where they are and just trying to help them move forward. Um, and sometimes that may involve helping them move forward while still continuing to use substances. Um, so they use a very strong harm reduction model um, and have had a lot of great success. Wow. More community resources and long-term support services. For brain injury, please always remember that the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission is the lead state agency for brain injury services. The Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts is the voice of brain injury within the Commonwealth. And what I would suggest, in addition to all of the resources that you've heard about previously, that you call the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts for any questions with about information or resources. We have a group of individuals who are there for you and will discuss your needs and really um, share information and resources with you. For the individuals, again, I cannot uh, begin to tell you how important support groups are for individuals with brain injury and their caregivers and their families and friends. In fact, I know for a fact that lives are changed by support groups. But please visit our website, call us, get more information about us, and use us. We're there for you. Just to quickly go over some substance use resources, um, in addition to everything that's already been described, which is largely connected to a lot of our partner organizations, um, there are also things like peer support groups. Again, this idea of people with lived experience supporting people with lived experience and that really being something that's important in not just the substance use world, but also the brain injury yes. world. And there are a variety of different peer support groups which are listed there. Um, you know, as we kind of move into some of our, our case studies, one of the things that we'll start trying to help you think about is, you know, what are the orientations of the different support groups and how can you support someone that you care about 
who has a brain injury and has some substance use challenges with getting connected to a group that makes sense for them. And then kind of similar to the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts, you know, Massachusetts does have an advocacy group that really is connected to um, people with lived experience, people who love and care for people with lived experience, called the Massachusetts Organization for Addiction Recovery. Um, they have a great website and, and provide a variety of advocacy-oriented resources as well. I, I have to make sure that I mention the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline. Um, this is your one-stop shop for any and all addiction resources in the state of Massachusetts. Um, it is sponsored by the Department of Public Health and the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, and it has a great resource finder that allows you to put in all this demographic information, your insurance, where you are in your recovery process, your use patterns, and kind of get a list of resources that make sense for where you are in that recovery journey. Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely want to encourage people to use that and check it out if you haven't. And then there's also even a national helpline through SAMHSA um, that I want to make sure that people are aware of and would encourage you to use that as well. Joint resources? Whoa, what's, <laughs> what's with that little guy? He's going like, what? Joint resources. You know, you know, so one of the things that, you know, Helen and I became aware of as we were putting together this presentation is that a lot of the resources that are out there really are designed to serve people in one of these two groups, but not mm -hmm. necessarily both. And that's a problem. And that's why, in part, this particular training series was developed. It was developed to really bring these two worlds together that normally don't have as much contact and start to build bridges. And so one of the things that we definitely want to make sure that we encourage people who are here in this training today is to make sure that you are reaching out across the aisle and you're getting to know people in the, in the other, on the other side. Um, and, and starting to build relationships with them and collaborate with them, and that some of these resources will actually have to be created by you all. Well, I don't think it's any secret that I personally think that your people are my people, mm -hmm. and my people are your people. Definitely. And if we don't work together, we are not giving folks what they need. Mm -hmm. We can't ignore it anymore. You know, one of the biggest predictors of a brain injury is having already sustained a brain injury. And I know that substance use disorders probably make people more at risk of brain injury. And brain injury, interestingly enough, and I've learned this, brain injury makes people more at risk of developing a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. So there has to be joint resources. Mm -hmm. There has to be places that are brain injury friendly or substance use disorder friendly within those services that we provide. So if it isn't there, we're tasked with building it. Mm -hmm. And this conversation, this very conversation gives everyone permission to reach out and say, hey, how come that doesn't exist yet? And I know that in our conversations, Lamar, I've asked you some pretty in there questions like, hey, wait a minute, what do you mean you don't do that? <laughs> and it's gotten, and, and you've asked me things too, and it's gotten both of us thinking about ways that we can open it up and provide better care for the people that we serve. And you know what? Isn't that what we want to do anyhow? Mm -hmm. we are, it's a beginning. We could start a movement. You know, like, like Helen said, the, the time really is now. Uh -huh. um, you know, the, the number of people who are overdosing, mm. the number of people who are overdosing and aren't rescued immediately and are having anoxic brain injuries mm -hmm. in that moment, um, the time really is now to try to make sure that we're developing appropriate resources to meet the needs of people who have both brain injuries 
anti substances. That's right. That's right. So we know that you know now. So we're tasking you with reaching out to one another. So we wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the common challenges and barriers to treatment. And, you know, this is really based on a lot of our experience Mm -hmm. as as providers, the things that we have seen in people that we work with who have brain injury and use substances. It's based on a variety of things that we've heard from a variety of people who are providers, people who have actual lived experience with brain injury and using substances. And we wanted to make sure that we took some time to kind of share this with you to raise your awareness around these different challenges and start to think, you know, what are some of the ways that we potentially can work together to meet these challenges and to overcome these challenges? So we pulled together a list of some different challenges. Um, You know, the first one that we we really want to lift up is, you know, really trying to fit, in essence, a square peg into a round hole. You know, think about the number of times that you've tried to connect someone to treatment, and there are a variety of different expectations around said treatment. And now think about how, from the previous trainings, the things that you've learned about you know, brain injury and the brain, its impact, its disruption of cognition, how with some challenges in those areas, it can make it even harder for someone to engage in programming that is a bit more rigid or has a very specific theoretical basis to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so part of what we are challenged with doing is really advocating for the people that we serve and making sure that when they enter into programs and they enter into systems, that we are supporting them and helping others around them understand what their needs are and make appropriate accommodations. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we just don't ask the right questions. And a lot of times it's because we don't fully recognize the difference that can be out there in these populations that we serve. You know, something as simple as, you know, have you ever fallen down while you were drinking and hit your head could open up a whole door of uh, options and questions and information that can kind of inform the direction in which you um, support someone in their recovery process. What would you say, Helen? Oh, I think asking the right questions is essential. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a relief Um, early on in my professional career to learn that I didn't have to have all the answers. Mm. The best thing that I could do was learn to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. So it makes all the difference in the world. Another common challenge can be staying calm when clients are reactive. You know, depending on where a person sustains their brain injury, Mm -hmm. that can impact the way in which they respond to situations, their ability to tolerate different types of situations, the way that they cope with different situations. And sometimes the way that they cope, the way they respond can be very reactive, expansive, and a bit jarring. And depending on what level of recognition is there with that brain injury, those behaviors can be interpreted in different Mm -hmm. ways. I think all of us can probably think of, especially those of us who work in, in, in addiction, of times where there was someone who was thought to be loud or difficult or angry or impulsive. And depending on what you knew about that person, depending on the way in which you looked at that person, that could influence the way that you engage them and the way that you try to support them. So one of, one of the challenges that we really need to be mindful of and meet is this idea that when we are working with people and assessing them, that we're kind of acknowledging and recognizing that in addition to the brain injury or in addition to the substance use, there may be a brain injury or substance use. And that that may require different ways of engaging and different ways of supporting. Yes, yes. That's really the basis of trauma-informed care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, I think a lot of times we under-recognize 
cognitive limitations. Mm -hmm. I know with brain injury, very often, and as I'm sure as, as Dr. Sperradio told you, there could be a lag in processing time, that it takes a little bit longer for a person with a brain injury to process information that's given. And very often, the person isn't even aware of it himself or herself. Um, and there's many other forms of cognitive limitations that you have learned about. However, brain injury is an invisible disease, and you may not, the person may not be a good historian. You know, I found that brain injury survivors can fool most of the people most of the time. And you know what? Sometimes they even fool themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's those people that are struggling with these cognitive limitations or a fluctuation in their cognitive abilities. Because it could be that the person's right as rain in the morning when their brain is rested and fresh, and then later in the day, things become a little bit murky for them. So I think that as clinicians of, of any type or anyone who's providing service to folks, you really have to be aware of what these cognitive challenges might be. I really like that you uplifted the idea that someone can have a certain type of experience in one part of the day mm. and a different type of experience in another part of the day. And, you know, when you lay that on top of something like a structured residential treatment program oh boy. <laughs> that's outlined a certain way, um, you know, that's something to be mindful of, mm -hmm. that a person may have some challenges earlier in the day, and there needs to be some accommodation for that. Um, and that's another common challenge, you know, helping other people to appreciate the need for accommodations. Mm. Helen, you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I know that in a future video, Dr. Chris Carter is going to give a wonderful, wonderful presentation on accommodations. Or another way of looking at it is compensatory strategies. Mm. And, you know, there are they are essential. They are essential. And I think people bristle against them at first. Survivors bristle against them at first and say, oh, I, don't, I shouldn't have to need to do that. But you know what? The person really does need to think of another way. It's just another way of reaching the same point. And again, back to that whole idea of putting the person in the best possible position for success. Mm -hmm. So do make sure that you attend Dr. Carter's uh, segment on accommodations. You know, rigid treatment philosophies, we touched on that just a little bit earlier, but mm. to expand on it more, um, definitely in the substance use world, there are a variety of different treatment modalities. There are a variety of different treatment philosophies on how a person should recover. And depending on what those are and how rigid or flexible they are, that can influence the level of success that someone who uses substances and has a brain injury can really have in the treatment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the ways to really overcome that is to just be mindful of what treatment philosophy a program uses, how flexible is that treatment philosophy, and how much does that treatment philosophy support and adapt to someone that has some of the unique challenges that someone with a brain injury who uses substances would have. Mm, yeah, that's right. That's right. And when I look at that square peg trying to go into that round hole, I think it says it all, right? Definitely. <laughs> we, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, just the fact that there aren't many brain injury substance use resources. Mm -hmm. This training is a step in creating some. As we talked about, BAMSI is doing some innovative things through this funding that MRC obtained to facilitate this training, but we need more. And so mm -hmm. the hope is that by viewing this training and being a part of this training series, that you can be a part of creating things that need to be created, but also disseminating information to colleagues. Yes. And, you know, that 
last point that we've made, understanding that challenging behaviors are not necessarily indicative of treatment resistance um, or a lack of investment in it. I know I've, I've been in the professional world for a long time, <laughs> and I know that the first, you know, very often the first bit of behavior that was I'll, I'll use the word impolite. How's that? <laughs> impolite. People were asked to leave treatment. Mm -hmm. And I know that with folks with brain injury, with all of the different implications that brain injury holds for individuals, um, there wouldn't be anybody with a brain injury in treatment for very long. Mm -hmm. And I know every brain injury is different. And... Um, but I also know that everybody deserves treatment um, for whatever it is that is keeping them from having the life that they wish that they could have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this discussion, I, I think what we're really talking about is, is reframing, you know, part of what we want to do in this work as well is to kind of reframe challenges as opportunities you know as as a provider i can say that some of the most challenging people that i've tried to support that use substances are people that have brain injuries um, with that said those are also opportunities opportunities for me to support someone who's extremely vulnerable in growing and 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 finding recovery in ways that maybe they haven't been able to, um, it's an opportunity for me to become more sensitive and empathetic. It's an opportunity for me to learn more and really amplify my my clinical skills and my clinical expertise. Mm -hmm. I like that. A challenge. Hmm is also an opportunity. Mm -hmm. It is. You're right about that. Oh, but then we get into the real world, right? We get into the real world. Yeah, we're not just sitting here and talking about it. We've got to do it. Right. Oh, my. So part of what we wanted to do was we wanted to offer a case study because that makes things feel more real and concrete. And it kind of puts a situation in what feels like more real world conditions, the things that we all deal with as providers. You know, Helen and I can sit here and we can talk to you about all these different resources. And I'm sure while we're talking about all of this, some of you are thinking about um, the different types of barriers that may become present in utilizing these resources. So we wanted to take a moment to really try to make this hit home and to, to kind of jointly work together in, in exploring a case. Um, so the, the first case that we're going to talk about, and depending on time, we may focus just on this one um, or we may incorporate another case, but um, case study one is really focused on someone named Sadie. And so Sadie is a 72-year-old widowed female. After she and her husband of 40 years retired two years ago, she suffered a fatal MI, or myocardial infarction, and she now lives alone in an elderly housing complex. The building manager noticed that she has become very withdrawn and isolative, keeps her curtains drawn, and rarely responds to phone calls. She has few friends and no family. She shops online for groceries and other necessities, but deliveries seem to have become more irregular in the past year. She is very defensive and unpleasant when approached, and you have been asked to connect with her and make an initial assessment. Oh my, oh Sadie, <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Well, you know, she's a very complex individual. She does, first of all, have the right to live her life as she chooses, mm -hmm. but somebody has become worried about her, and they're is not a lot of concrete information there. I don't know who it is who has become concerned. It could be your primary care physician. It could be the person 
who manages her elderly housing complex. It could be a neighbor, mm -hmm. but somebody's worried about her. There is a red flag prominently displayed in Sadie's window, mm -hmm. I think. I think it's interesting that she gets her groceries online and there are still deliveries coming in, but they're a little bit more sporadic. I think it would be very normal um, to think that she's probably depressed because she and her husband had been waiting all these years to finally enjoy retirement, and then he ups and dies on her, you know? What, what a hard thing. I have a sense that she's moved into this elderly housing complex since her husband's death, so mm. she has had many losses, many, many losses. But we don't know what's going on behind those drawn curtains. What do you think we should look for? Well, I think that something that's important is we don't know what's going on. <laughs> exactly. And we're only going to know or find out what we ask about. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we look at this case and we see that she's 72, we see that she suffered a heart attack, she lives in an elderly complex, housing complex, and um, seems to be depressed, and we just start asking questions that are very focused on that, mm -hmm. potentially we might be missing big pieces. Yeah. And so this is what we're kind of talking about when it comes down to we need to make sure that we ask the right questions and we need to make sure that we're not assuming anything. Mm -hmm. You know, We need to make sure that we're not assuming that just because Sadie is 72 that she may not like to drink. Or we're not assuming that just because Sadie's 72 that she can't find meaningful recovery. Or that we're not assuming that just because um, Sadie is, is, is difficult to engage and defensive and unpleasant, that that means that she genuinely does not want help and she doesn't want to change her situation. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, I know it's projection, but I see a lady who, whose life has just fallen apart. She lost her husband, and now she's alone in a little apartment with no family and few friends. And she doesn't really have a lot of meaning in her life. I think one word on that little case study write-up, you have been asked to connect with her, mm. connect, to make a connection, um, and to make an initial assessment. I think that the connection itself is probably very, very important, and it would be so, so um, important to also consider, as you said, not going in, the, in there with any preconceived notions about Sadie. I know that if Sadie has been drinking, um, that she's more at risk of falling within that apartment and sustaining a brain injury. I know that as people age, brain injuries, especially by falls, are more and more significant because of what happens to the brain as it ages. So with those lenses in looking at Sadie, I would be a little bit concerned about them, um, about those two aspects of her life. I wonder if she has been seeing her physician, her primary care physician, for her checkups, her yearly checkups, or if she's just pushed everything away, um, as often happens as one falls or tumbles down that slippery slope from taking a glass of wine to help you sleep at night when you're sad um, and just can't sleep after losing someone, so slipping down that slippery slope into just using um wine or whatever substance the person might choose um, as, as a means of nutrition because nobody starts out to be in the substance use disorder world. I mean, we drink socially and we like what it does, but there's a point that it just starts to take a life of its own. Mm. And I think that it's that's something that's very important to consider. I also 
again, just because my background is brain injury, I would be worrying about, has she fallen in that apartment? Does, you know, does she ever wake up in the morning on the floor, not remembering that she decided to be on the floor, mm -hmm. that she would be on the floor secondary to a fall of some sort? Um, yeah, there, there are all kinds of things to consider there. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, as, as a substance use provider, I would be, one, you know, not assuming that she doesn't have access to substances mm. just because she gets her groceries delivered, because um, mm -hmm. I think we all know that it is possible to get alcohol delivered, and yes. it's also possible to get friends to just drop things off for you. Um, I think I would be wondering about what her life has been like in regards to substances um, mm -hmm. and how potentially that could be exacerbated by the, the loss of a significant other and a variety of other isolating factors. I would, you know, definitely not assume, like I said before, that certain substances are off limits just because of her age, um, because I think we know that there are a variety of different substances out there and there are age restrictions on their use. Um, and then based on, you know, this training and conversations that we have, you know, I would definitely be wondering about things like, you know, when she had the heart attack, you know, what was involved in that? Mm -hmm. Did she maybe fall and hit her head? Was there like a loss of oxygen to where she maybe could have had an anoxic brain injury? Um, and I'd be trying to pull all those things together to really understand her. And I would create a line of questioning that speaks to those things, mm. um, all while trying to build a relationship mm -hmm. and build rapport and use that to help all of this move forward. You know, just considering her age, I think that she would be somebody who would be reluctant at first because of the stigma involved. Mm -hmm. um, I know that now, in this day and age, we see substance use disorders as, as a chronic dis-ease. Uh, we use a medical model, a chronic recurrent condition. Um, but she's a little bit older, and she no doubt remembers when it was sort of a moral issue, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of judgment involved in it. Um, there's a lot to think about there. I, I wish Sadie well. And you know what? I have a confession to make. I made up this little case study um, remembering uh, a gal, an older lady, that I took care of um, when I was working on a general nursing floor early in my career. She had retired with her husband. He died. And she was just left alone. And I took care of her for the last weeks of her life. And she would talk to me. I worked the evening shift. And she said several times, Helen, I never drank. I never drank before my husband died. And at first, I would have a little something to help me go to sleep at night. And it took a life of its own. No one ever told me that it would kill me. No one ever told me that this would be the end of my life. So I wrote that little case study in memory of her. And hopefully her story will help another Sadie somewhere in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And we can be a little bit wiser and a little bit kinder and a little bit more aware that substance use disorder can happen to anyone, just like brain injury. You know, if we are kind of establishing or assuming that Sadie does have a substance use disorder, you know, when we think back to some of the different resources that we've mm. talked about, um, specifically some of those mass health resources, um, the recovery coach, the community support program worker, those are both community-based, community-driven mobile connections. Mm. So for someone like Sadie, who seems to, you know, spend a nice amount of time at home, possibly might be resistant to the idea of leaving, um, may need something that's kind of coming to her and working on her terms, at least initially, 
um, those could be really good resources mm -hmm. because they're outreach oriented and community connected. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. I know that people that are watching probably have thoughts about it too. And I'm very happy about that because if you're thinking about it and thinking about other approaches, we've done our job because we've got you thinking about it. We've got you thinking about Sadie and all the people in your caseload and the people that you know through your professional life. You know, but, but a big takeaway from this would be that if you were to look through her, look at her excuse exclusively through a brain injury lens mm. or an aging lens oh, yeah. or a substance use lens, and you didn't use all of those in an integrated fashion, you wouldn't mm. be serving her well. Exactly. Exactly. I want to be mindful of time, and we definitely want to make sure that we leave time for some oh, questions yeah. at the end. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we should do our next case study or get forward? You know what? I think I'll read it, and I think as I read it, people are going to start thinking about things. Sounds good. Because I think Andy has a couple of things going on in his life. Andy has been a reluctant participant in the day program at your agency. He seems to want to maintain his sobriety, but it seems as if he's sabotaging both himself and his sobriety. He often comes in late and is very defensive when asked about this. He rarely completes any home assignments and says only, Ah, I forgot. He's sometimes disruptive in group meetings. He presents as loud and often interrupts others. Other days, he's quiet and brooding, staying away from everyone. He refuses to attend 12-step meetings in the community because he hates those stupid losers. Is there anything that might help Andy connect with the day program and support his recovery? Mm. Huh, what do you think? Well, because of our conversations and because of this training, you know, I'm, I'm starting to kind of question where some of this response may be coming from. Mm. Um, you know, one way to look at it is that there's a character logical component, you know, or there's some sort of mental illness that's driving the mood changes. You know, another way to look at it is, you know, maybe he's just uh, a, a mean alcoholic. <laughs> and Aww, but yet, Andy. An, but yet, another way to look at it, um, you know, is is maybe this is someone who's possibly sustained a brain injury, mm -hmm. and some of this, some of this anger and some of this reactiveness is a consequence of the brain injury, or it's his potential. It's potentially him trying to cover up and compensate for a level of functioning that he no longer has post the brain injury. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Helen? Oh, gosh. I'm a little biased. I think anyone with a recognized substance use disorder mm -hmm. probably has sustained a brain injury. <laughs> I mean, people oftentimes don't make good decisions when they're under the influence of a substance. And I would wonder that, you know, Andy may have been in an altercation with someone at the local pub. He may have been in a motor vehicle event with someone uh, who was driving under the influence, or perhaps he was. He may have been um, under the influence and has fallen um, and hit his head. We don't know if he um, has ever taken an overdose where he was revived, mm -hmm. uh, like an opio opioid overdose, and might have sustained an anoxic or hypoxic injury um, and actually could have also had a traumatic brain injury because he's fallen during that event. Um, I know that people with brain injury and people with substance use disorder oftentimes are not the greatest historians. 
Um, if someone falls during a blackout or gets in an altercation during a blackout, that person isn't going to remember it. So it's up to us as clinicians to start, again, asking the right questions, becoming as if a de detective, you know, take off your professional hat and put on your detective hat, your Sherlock Holmes hat, and, and really start to ask these questions in a very caring manner. You know, what I see there is, I mean, he's in a day program for substance use disorders, but I see a guy with brain injuries. He forgets things. He doesn't do the homework. I think it's really key that he seems to want to maintain his sobriety, but it seems like his behavior and his actions are, are sabotaging him. A brain injury uh, survivor oftentimes is disruptive in a group meeting and interrupts others because there's that compulsion to say what you're thinking about because you'll forget it if you don't say it just mm -hmm. then. And then there's the filters. I mean, if the filters are gone, you're going to hear anything at any time. Um, and quiet and brooding, you know, it could be that he just doesn't have any cognitive energy that day. And if you push him into a corner and start demanding answers, he might not be the pleasant guy that he wants to be. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many ways of looking at this. How could we help him connect, though, with the day program and support his recovery? What do you think? Well, in listening to you talk, I think one of the things that really hit home for me was that when it even comes to trying to figure out how to support Andy, how to respond to this, it's all based on your assessment and your formulation. Mm. And so if I'm thinking to myself, maybe there's something else going on, like a brain injury, and I start to look at these different behaviors and this different way of engagement against that backdrop, for me, I feel that my response takes on more dimensions mm -hmm. and that it is richer mm -hmm. and that it potentially has less judgment mm -hmm. attached to it, um, which I think is really important. I think one of the things that also kind of sticks out to me when we're thinking about resources is, you know, I've, I've worked with people who don't like 12-step meetings. And, and, and that's a real thing. And, you know, fortunately, there are more peer recovery support meetings out there than just 12-step meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking that someone like Andy, um, you know, potentially would enjoy something like Smart Recovery, mm -hmm. which doesn't use a 12-step model, um, tends to be a little more cerebral. And, and for someone like him who who just doesn't feel a connection with people that do 12-step and, and maybe has an affinity more towards things that maybe tap into a kind of quote-unquote intellectual side, like this could be um, something that he might enjoy. Um, but, but definitely, definitely sitting here thinking about how to ask questions and to consider the possibility that what is you're seeing is impacted by a reflection of a brain injury mm -hmm. really can change the way in which you choose to intervene. And it can underscore the need for the importance of accommodation. Exactly. You know, Andy himself may have forgotten whatever incident it was that caused him to have a brain injury. It could have been nothing that was wildly exciting. It could have been a concussion. And a concussion is a brain injury. And brain injuries are cumulative. So maybe the one that he remembers um, was just the one that kind of, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Um, and even though it may not have been um, one that was so memorable, it still could be something that has put a whole lot of changes into his life, and he just doesn't understand it. He could think that his challenges in cognition are just secondary to his drinking. Mm -hmm. So 
he may not have even put two and two together. I'm very glad that our session is going to be followed up um, next week by one that refers to how to screen for brain injury. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to be diagnosing brain injuries, uh, but screening for the possibility of brain injury is something that's very, very important here. Mm -hmm. And also, I would think that Andy would need some education around brain injury. I would suggest he goes to a brain injury support group, but that's me, you know. But I would also want if it was decided that a brain injury was a possibility or a probability, mm -hmm. that people in the day program also learn more about brain injury so that they can understand that this isn't just something that he's just doing to be a little bit raucous in your group, mm -hmm. that this is something that he has to deal with on a daily basis. So I would want the staff at the day program to understand about accommodations also. And if he did, and I loved your idea about like, a recovery coach, um, that recovery coach would also need to understand some about brain injury too. Mm -hmm. I mean, brain injury is baffling. It mm -hmm. really is when you see that every brain injury is different, and yet there are common threads among survivors. And that's partly where you would all come in, because you might be trying to connect someone to a resource, to a provider, and that provider doesn't know anything about mm -hmm. brain injury. They don't know anything about substance use. And hopefully through this training series, you'll require at least some basic language to where you can kind of help other people to understand different things that they need to keep in mind. You will start asking questions that you haven't been asking before and start to kind of look at the people that you work with using multiple lenses that are integrated. That was really the thinking behind these case studies. It wasn't necessarily that there's some right answer for us all to reach <laughs> together, but that there are really some opportunities for us to think and assess and be intentional around questions that we ask and the choices and actions that we make to support people. Mm -hmm. Good points. So if you have any continued thoughts about these case studies, talk about them within the staff at your agency. Talk about them with your friends. Start to build those bridges. So we did want to offer just some different resources on professional development um, because this, this is a continued learning process. You're going to learn more through this series, but even beyond that, you'll need to continue learning. So we wanted to kind of offer different resources that would be helpful. Well, the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts, as I said earlier, provides many educational opportunities for professionals. I mentioned our continuing ed series, the ACBIS program, our brain injury conference, and also, um, this is a little something that I wanted to offer you. We have an initial program called the Scope of ABI that you will be able to give us a call, contact us in any way, um, and book the Scope of ABI for your agency. It's just a basic brain injury awareness program to help you get your staff talking about brain injury. And I think it's a wonderful way um, to kind of wet your toes and get that education process going. There are a variety of different substance use professional development options, and I'll go through some of the main ones um, that we at the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services support and utilize, um, and many of these are completely free of charge. Um, Careers of Substance um, is a very rich resource. Um, they have lists for all of the BSAS recovery coach trainings. Um, they have information on all of the BSAS training for behavioral health trainings. Um, the Black Addiction Counselor Education Initiative, which is an initiative that focuses on trying to increase the number of 
Black Licensed Alcohol and Drug Counselors and its complementary program, LACE, or the Latinx Addiction Counselor Education Program. AdCare Educational Institute offers a variety of different trainings related to substance use and addiction for people in a variety of different phases of learning around the topic. Praxis, um, C4 Innovations, is something that BSAS funds um, to provide a variety of different free trainings to providers. Um, the New England Addiction Technology Transfer Center um, is, is also a resource, and that resource is really there to support not just substance use programming, but non-substance use programming that wants to learn more about addiction within mm -hmm. New England. Um, about some of the different resources that are out there. And of course, there's a great CE website called Addiction Counselor CE. Joint professional development. My goodness, isn't that what we're doing right here? That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're doing, yes. <laughs> That's what we're doing. And you know, the, the little graphic that you chose is just perfect for that kind of passing the torch on. Mm -hmm. So those of you who are here today really need to pass the torch on to other people in your agency. I know that this series is going to be available um, in the future and it, because it's being filmed today and is being filmed for every one of our offerings. So you can bring that into your agency to pass that torch forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the torch also kind of denotes that there's a certain responsibility when you learn this information. Mm -hmm. And if you're really trying to make more global change, there's a responsibility to share the information that you've learned with others and also to use the information that you've learned to intervene appropriately with clients and with people that work with your clients. That's right. Keep that torch burning. Yes. Gosh, there are some virtual cross-training opportunities, and many of these are free of charge. I know that even though it says the Elder's Web course, it has all to do with brain injury. But final thoughts? Hmm. So these are just some takeaways that we want people to hold in their mind when they leave here and carry forward as they try to um, support this very unique population. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Be rich and generous with your fellow clinicians. Collaboration is the key. You know, knowledge is not something that needs to be guarded and kept in a little box and not shared. The more generous you are, the better it's going to flourish and the happier everyone will be. Addiction, you know, is a chronic condition, and it's also not a moral failing. And a lot of you may already know that, may believe that, but you'd be surprised the number of people that still see it in kind of that old framework. So just keep that in mind, that even if you don't see it that way, others that you come across may, and there may need to be some education. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, and assume nothing. Assume nothing. Always practice client-centered, trauma-informed care, especially with brain injury. Use accommodations as needed. And if it doesn't exist, build it. Yes, we'll build it. You know, rarely, rarely does one person hold the entire answer. Recovery is real. It's something that is achievable. And it's achievable for both individuals with addiction, with brain injury, and both. Mm -hmm. And relapse is often a part of the recovery process. So a relapse isn't necessarily a failing. Mm -hmm. It's something... That, are, that may occur to help a person move towards the sobriety that they're striving for. Mm -hmm. It's true. Here it is. Strive to ask the right questions. 
Your client has the wisdom needed to find the right answer for him, her, themselves. If you can unlock it with the right answer, right question, the right question. Strive to find creative ways to meet the needs of your client. You know, as we talked about, a lot of the things that are needed for people that have brain injury and use substances don't exist. So until we can build some of those things, we have to get creative by how we meet the needs of our clients. Mm -hmm. And then there are multiple pathways to recovery. So even if you think that a person should go down a very specific prescribed path to reach a specific recovery goal, keep in mind that there are multiple pathways to recovery and what works for one person may not work for another and vice versa. It's true. It's true. I, I just wanted to add something about BIAMA. We're currently working um, behind the scenes on a new website. So I've encouraged people to come to our website several times during this presentation, and soon there will be a new one up there. Um, and so even if you've been to our website in the past, look forward to our new website. And another thing that's coming down the pike is we have been working uh, for a good while on putting together yet another support group, which would be one specific for folks with brain injury who also have substance use disorder. Oh, that's great. Wouldn't that be great? I, that's, been, that's been something I've been very interested in for a long time. So watch our website for that, too. Oh, contact. Yes, contact us. I'm Helen, and this is Lamar, and we are here for you. Please keep the conversation going. You know, just know that from this point forward, you have us as a resource. Yes. And you have the agencies that we work for as a resource. And if there's anything that we can do to help you in and of our own right or connect you to additional resources, we will definitely do that. You know, one of the hidden gems, I think, of this presentation for me personally, has been getting to know Lamar um, and, to, and to know his world. And, and by us having the need to build this presentation, we've built bridges too. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. That is the spirit of the grant. And remember that, that slide way back at the beginning where you saw substance use disorder world and brain injury world and that beautiful wooden bridge between them, be the bridge, be the bridge. Thank you.